We're going through the book of James, and James is, man, full of wisdom. And you can tell that, that James, the, the author of the book of James, he was really well-versed in the Jewish scriptures of wisdom, uh, scriptures like uh, the Proverbs and some of the Psalms. And even in the book of Job, there's great wisdom to draw from. And then, of course, being the brother of Jesus, how many know that you might have some good wisdom nuggets in your pocket if you were the brother of Jesus? Well, that's James. And he's writing to a church that had been scattered around the region, uh, uh, scholars say primarily due to persecution. And so they're struggling in in this new communities that they're living in and they're having a hard time. Uh, they're having lots of trials and lots of difficulties. And how many have some trials and difficulties in your life, living out your faith uh, among a world that doesn't necessarily agree with your faith. And in, in line with their struggle, some of them, their struggle was overtaking them. And it was really obvious by the way that James wrote. And, and some of them, in fact, uh, they were almost just leaving their faith behind. And James steps up to the plate to this church and he begins to write to them. And James is not very nurturing to the church in this moment. I mean, the church knew that James loved them, but the church did not need a nurturer. They needed a coach. And they needed somebody to come in and uh, bring the heat on them, to let them know what's up, just to make it plain and black and white. And so here's James writing to this church who had a ton of problems. And, uh, you know, I know you don't have any problems. It might be hard for you to connect with what James is saying today, but I bet you if you look really deep um, that he will speak to you. This church was struggling with some things like favoritism and, you know, people were coming into the church and James was not treating, the people of the church were not treating everybody equally. And so James kind of steps in and, and he speaks to this crowd in this way. Now, if you missed last week's message, uh, you can check it out by listening to our podcast on Apple or Spotify. You could also check out uh, the message if you wanna watch it on our church center or YouTube channel, all right? So uh, the theme verse for our series comes from James 1, 5. James chapter one, verse five. And James is telling us this, hey, everyone who's struggling, if you need wisdom, he says, just ask our generous God. And he's gonna give it to you. He won't rebuke you for asking. James is saying, hey, no matter what troubles and struggles you're having, having God is always here at your side to speak wisdom in your life because he wants to help you and he wants to help the world around him. Let's pray. Lord, we love you. And we thank you for who you are. We thank you for your word. We thank you for uh, your Holy Spirit that inspired James to write to this church and uh, even teach us still today, thousands of years later. We love you. We open our hearts to you and we submit our minds to you in Jesus name. Amen. Hey, by the way, a couple tips. Uh, you know, if you hear something that you're like, man, that was really good. You guys can do, you can say like, mm, like that, like that tasted good. So I'm going to just give you a little try. Say, that was really good. You say, mm. and then, uh, man, if something like strikes you, like you're like, oh man, that stepped on my toes. That hurt. You can just be like, mm, that hurt. Yeah, one, two, three, that hurt. And uh, man, if something was like, you're like, it hurt and it felt good, then you just amen. And I always say, say a big amen. So one, two, three, big amen. amen. So, uh, you know, let's all have some fun today. While we're, we're gonna need to try to have fun because this is a really, really strong passage. So how many are ready for a little bit of heat today? So uh, the book of James. So James, the wise guy, is, is writing to this group of people. And, and uh, you know, if we really check James out clearly, um, you know, we could be, we could kind of notice some things incorrectly uh, when we're reading James. And, and it's really careful that, that we don't enter James and see him as an anti-faith and pro-works kind of a guy. And uh, here, here's what I mean by this. We have to be careful to not read into James what is not there. And that's a Bible tip for you when you're reading scriptures. Don't read into scripture what is not there. Uh, we must always read all of scripture with the backdrop of all of scripture, not just one little nugget or one little thing. And so as we approach James, we need to read it in light of all of Paul's writings, in light of the entire gospel, in light of the new covenant, we have to read James. And so I can remember when, uh, when I was freed from 
religion. I don't know if you've ever kind of had that experience, but several years back, I, I have found myself trying to earn my salvation, trying to earn my approval, trying to, trying to get the Father to accept me because I was unsure if he loved me. I was unsure if he accepted me. And so I was trying to be a good little Christian soldier uh, until suddenly I was confronted with the gospel. And I realized that I was truly saved by my faith in Christ. I realized that I moved into a new status with the Father. I had always been there, I just didn't know it. And I was saved, I was loved by him, I was accepted by him, I was approved by him, and I no longer needed to try to work to get these things from him because of the power of the gospel. What I noticed happened when the gospel hit my life in this way is my, what I like to call my religious trauma tried to jump out every time I approached scriptures. And when I came across words like faith or striving or works or obedience or old covenant, I would like get a little funky and I had to slow myself down and allow the Holy Spirit to help speak a new kind of work out of my life and a new kind of obedience from my life. And I kind of had to learn these things all over again in a brand new way. You know, sometimes uh, if we're not careful, we can just look at James and be like, James is all about work. I'm not reading that book, which would be totally incorrect and totally uh, debilitating to our faith. Um, sometimes we try to put uh, Paul and James up against each other with works and faith, but it's interesting. If we read Paul, we will see works all over the place. I mean, he's really strong. He's super strong on faith. Uh, one of the things that we notice in, in Ephesians 2 and 8, uh, James, Paul says this. He says, in one breath, he says, it's by grace we're saved through faith. And then if we go a couple verses later, he says this, and now that you're saved, you're Christ's workmanship, created to do what? Good works in Christ Jesus. And so James and Paul are complementary towards one another, not contradictory. Let's take a look and see what uh, James has to say about wisdom and obedience. That's what we're gonna talk about today, wisdom and obedience. James makes some incredible connections uh, in James chapter one, starting at verse 19. And he actually goes all the way through into James two, all the way down to about verse 26. That'd be some good uh, Bible reading for you this week. We read a ton of it during scripture. Today, I'm gonna just read some nuggets, but I want you to make sure to go home and dig in and get some really, really good context. Let's notice one of the first things we say we see James say to this group in regards to wisdom and obedience. James says it's wise in your notes to be obedient with our actions towards others. We love that word obedient, huh? Be obedient with your actions towards others. Here's what he says in James 1, 22. He says, don't merely listen to the word. How many know was we see a word like that? We're, when it says the word, it's talking about the written word. It's talking about the living word. Don't merely listen to the written word or listen to the living word, Jesus, and so deceive yourself. Do what it says. Anyone who listens but does not do what it says is like someone who looks at his face in a mirror and after looking at himself, he goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. What is James saying here? James is saying that there are many people who listen to the word of God and it has no effect in their life. God did not die on the cross and empower believers with the Holy Spirit to have no effect in our life. James is saying there's a lot of people that are traditionally attending religious gatherings for various reasons, friendship, community, economic, business reasons, or maybe to check off the spiritual activity box on their list. But to this group, he says, hey guys, let's all be honest. Let's not play games. Don't waste your time. Don't do that. There's, there's no point to playing games. I mean, if you're gonna be in this thing, then be in this thing. And James is kinda pretty strong, and I can imagine him literally saying this, that you think you're a part of God's body, but it's clear by your actions that you're really not. Your heart's not in it. And James was really strong with this struggling, struggling audience, and he does something really powerful. He gives them a mirror illustration. And here's what he says about this mirror. And by the way, <clears throat> the mirror represents the word of God as he's speaking to them. He's saying this about this mirror. <clears throat> he says that when you take a look in the mirror into the word of God, it acts like a reflector. 
right? We all get that, right? You get in the mirror, it reflects back your image. And, and here's what it does. To, to the, the believer and to the lost, it reflects their sinfulness. It reflects where they're missing the mark. And it reflects also God's plan for redemption for us. And it reflects the good news to us. And, and then for believers, it reflects all those things. But for believers, it reflects back to them their image of God. It shows them who they're really supposed to be in Christ. And that's really important for believers because when you know who you are and you know what you're about and you know why you exist to be a dispenser of the image of God to the world, to share the message of the cross with the world, to share the good news with the world, then your actions would display those things. And James is saying, you guys don't have any actions that make you look anything like what you profess. You say one thing out of your mouth, but your life looks completely different. So James is telling them, hey, the challenge, the problem with you is you're you're taking quick glances and then you walk away and you forget who you are and you don't live out your life of faith. See, the challenge with us when we take a quick glance into the mirror and walk away and forget, it's because we're glancing, we're not gleaming, we're not engaging, we're not staying. And and so if you just attend church on Sunday and that's the only time you look into the mirror, it's just a quick glance. If the only time you read scripture is when you're scrolling Facebook and you see someone else's scripture that they post, it's just a glance. And James is saying that's as good as just taking a quick glance, walking away, you're gonna forget what you look like. We need to glean from the word. We need to look intently, James says. We need to look on purpose. We need to open our heart and say, Lord, Holy Spirit, show me where I'm missing the mark. And also show me how your son plans to heal that in me and deliver me from that and help me to walk in freedom and help me to walk in deliverance and show me what the new me looks like. I think the question that we would definitely have to ask ourselves is what are we doing with the mirror that we've been given. He says, when you walk away, he says, remember who you are. Remember who you are. When we walk away from the word and we know who we are, we're gonna have some amazing actions of love and kindness toward the ones around us. And James gets super strong in verse 22. You know, he's just a bottom line guy. And so he says, when you get in the word, he says, just do what it says. (laughs) Just find someone to love. Be kind. Think about the fruits of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness. I mean, just be a dispenser of the Spirit and love people well because actions flow from our self-image, the way we see ourselves, the way Christ has created us. See, for James, being a doer is really important, even though it's costly for that audience. It costs them relationships, reputation, resources. Some of them, they're very live. And I think we would have to ask ourselves the question the same today. James looks at you and I and he says, being a doer is costly. Are you willing to pay the price of relationships? Are you willing to pay pay the, the social price? Are you willing to give up your very own life? We're talking about wisdom and obedience. I told you James is strong today. There's not a ton of jokes here in the message. I just, like if I made a joke in the middle of James's like conversation about, you know, coaching, like if you ever try to interrupt a coach before, it's not a good idea. So I'm not gonna do that this morning. The second thing that we notice James says is he says this, it's wise to be obedient in our acceptance of others. Be obedient in our acceptance of others. In James 2.8, he says this, he says, hey guys, if you, if you keep the royal law found in scripture, and it's this, love your neighbors as yourself, you're doing the right thing. But he tells them, but you're not. You're not keeping the royal law. I mean, you brag about your faith, but your faith is not about a belief or something that you have in your mind. It's also about actions, about loving your neighbor kind of actions. And I can't imagine that this audience, it had to remind them of um, some previous laws that they knew in Leviticus 19, 18. And it was was like, guys, this is not a new law. This is something that's been around a very long time. Loving people is a staple part of who God is and displaying and sharing that love is a staple part of who he is. This next portion of scripture uh, we read from James 2, starting at verse 2, and I'm going to paraphrase this because here was the problem. Here's why James says to love your neighbor. He said, because in your church, 
guys, James tells them, he says, there's, there's people who are coming through the door. And there's rich people coming through the door and there's poor people coming through the door. And I'm watching how you love your neighbor well, unconditionally. And I'm watching that some of you are flocking to that rich person because you know that you can get something out of that rich person. And everyone's leaving the poor person off to their side and that poor person is not getting loved. And by the way, that rich person that you're, that you're loving on, he's also preying on the other people in the church, jacking their money too. So James comes and he confronts them and he challenged them and he says this, he says, if you show favoritism, that's sin. Well, James was super strong, and what is the principle for you and I? Well, the, the principle is this, is that we cannot show favoritism generationally. We cannot show favoritism uh, racially or ethnically or financially or based on someone's education status or their gender because love loves all. See, for James, James knew that to dishonor a brother in this way was to dishonor God because we were not loving his image very well. Verse 13, he goes on and he says something really strong to this church. He says, he says uh, chapter two, verse 13, mercy triumphs over judgment. See, this is a, a rare commodity today as it was back then. Mercy was a rare commodity. James was saying, hey guys, be merciful towards those you disagree with because being merciful is better than being judgmental. And it works the same way in our culture today. There are people that you agree and disagree with. There are certain generations that you disagree with their mindsets. There are certain ethnicities that you disagree with their beliefs. There are certain economic statuses of people that you agree and disagree with. There are certain genders that you agree and disagree with. And the list can go on and on and on. And James says, don't be so focused on what you disagree with and be judgmental toward them. He says, I want you to be merciful for, towards them the same way I was merciful towards you when I disagreed with your sin. So it would be only right for us today to open our hearts and say, Holy Spirit, examine me. What are you saying to me? How are you calling me to be obedient towards, with my actions towards other people and the way that I accept other people? Help me to not show favoritism. And, and I gotta admit today that, man, I show favoritism. I do. I show favoritism towards people who are like me, towards people who think like me. Why? Because it's easier. There's less disagreement if we hang out and we all agree about the same thing. But guess what? I have a very narrow perspective when I'm surrounded with only people who think like me. It's more comfortable for me. I love going on activities and hanging out with people that like to ride bikes because it's simple. We get on the bike, it's not complicated. You know, we balance and we pedal and we go, that's it. I don't like to hang out with painters. I'm terrible at painting. It's humiliating if I hang out with you and you're just like, I'm like, I'm like, like it's embarrassing. So that's why I like to hang out with people who are like me because it's humbling to hang out with people who are not like me. And Jesus says, be humbled. Get around some people. Diversify yourself. He says, look at your circle of life. Make sure that you have generations represented around you. Make sure that you have people that think differently from you. Make sure you have different ethnicities surrounded by you and different educational statuses of people surrounded by you. Diversify yourself. That, when you do that, you know that you are not being, you're not showing favoritism towards the people that you're willing to love because you're willing to love all. Now, clarification, James is not saying accept other people's beliefs and accept their behavior. That's an entire different conversation. He's just simply saying, be acceptance of my creation that I created. I want to redeem them. And if you don't accept them, you're my plan A. They're not going to, they're not going to experience redemption. James is talking about wisdom and obedience today. He's, he said to make sure that we're obedient with our actions, make sure that we're obedient in our acceptance of others. And then number three, he says, be obedient with our faith in Christ. Be obedient with our faith in Christ. James is saying to this audience, he says, I want you to have a new kind of faith. And it's a strong word. A kind of faith that's, a, that's an obedient faith. I know you love the word obedience. 
I know you love when people say, be obedient and be obedient to me. And I know you love the, when the word of God says, be obedient. I know it's your favorite word. You're like, you perk up when you hear obedience. Vince is like, we've got one honest guy in the room that's like, nope, I don't. And I'm with you, I'm with you, Vince, man. I'm the same way. I'm not a huge fan when, when I have to come into submission. Why? Because it's painful to my flesh. It's humiliating. It's, it's hard on everything about me. I don't, I don't like it, but I know what's good for me. And James was challenging this audience. And so here in James chapter two, verses 14 through 26, James kind of sums up everything that he has said on this topic by saying this in James two, four. He says, what good is it, dear brothers and sisters, if you say you have faith, but you don't show it by your actions? Can that kind of faith save anybody? James is like, that's a waste of faith. I mean, that, that is a waste of salvation. I mean, why, why save somebody who's gonna keep their mouth silent and who's not gonna have the actions of the Father out of their life? He's saying, that's a waste of faith. He's saying, you guys claim that you're Christians. I mean, you study, you educate yourself, you love getting in the word, but when I watch you out in the community, I can't tell you're a fellow believer. I mean, what a strong indictment. You know, Christianity has a really bad taste in the mouth of our culture because perhaps maybe our actions don't line up with what we profess. When James challenges him with this question, when he says, can that faith save anybody? He's not asking them about their own faith. He's not questioning their faith. He's questioning what they profess. He's saying, can the faith you profess by the way that you live around people, will that bring salvation to anybody? Will that heal anybody by the way you live and act? Will that show people that you believe that God wants to free people from sin by the way that you act and love people? Will that faith save anybody? So he wasn't questioning their salvation. He was questioning uh, their, their works and their acts from their life. Would it bring salvation to others? What does it look like for you and I as the church to have a, an obedient kind of faith? Well, I think we have to look at the most obedient person who ever walked on the planet. His name was Jesus. He was perfectly obedient to the will of the Father. And we see in Isaiah 61, the prophet uh, giving us a picture into what a life uh, looks like when they walk in perfect obedience to the Father. And we see Jesus live it out. Here's what it says. It says, when a person walks in perfect obedience to the Father, he says, he's gonna bring good news to the poor. He's gonna bind up the brokenhearted. He's gonna proclaim freedom for the captives. He's gonna release those who are in bondage to sin. He's gonna comfort those who mourn. Do you, do you see this? This is not just a, a verbal message, but it is a, a life action kind of message. And as Jesus lived uh, in perfect obedience to the Father, he lived this out. People heard the good news. The poor were touched. The brokenhearted were healed. The captives were delivered. In fact, that's what he's done to you and I. His message was a tangible message. It impacted our life. Here's the question for us today. What kind of person are we? Are we an Isaiah 61 kind of person, obedient with our faith in the way that Jesus was obedient? Are we in Isaiah kind of 61 church? Are you a part of a church like that? I would say many, yes. But this, the same way that this hit home for many in James's church, perhaps it sits at home with you as well and it challenges you. And here's what James says. If you're not, come on, get this, listen. Church is just not about, Jesus didn't say, hey, go build churches, get butts in the seats, get offerings and everybody have awesome worship and great streaming services and go home, no. He said, we're expanding the kingdom together. And he says, look into your life. If you have not brought good news to the poor lately, not just physically, but naturally poor in the spirit, he says, check yourself. He says, if you have not bound up the broken heart lately, if you have not put your heart or your arm around somebody and given them somebody warm to hold, check your heart. 
Church, if you have not stepped into somebody's life and proclaimed freedom for somebody who is captive to sin and, and held in bondage, and you don't look at them in the eyes and say, God can deliver you. He can help you with that. He wants you free because he loves you. You are not what you do. You are who he says he is. Then maybe you should check yourself. See, living this type of life, this obedient faith type of life, is not reserved for pastors, leaders, small group leaders, and, and the church folk that you look at and say, I can never be like that. Everybody take their hand and go like this and say, he wants to do that in me. He wants to do that in you. And James takes it a step further later on, chapter 5, verse 16, to the same church. He says, if you can't live that kind of faith out of your life, then I, I want you to get humble, figure out why, get into the mirror that's gonna show you who re you really are. And then he says this in James 5 and 16, confess your sins one to another that you may be healed. Maybe it's, a, maybe it's a sin in your life that is holding you back from speaking freely. Not only is your sin destroying you, but your sin is hindering you from preaching the gospel freely. Now, we gotta understand that in the new covenant, there was one sacrifice that was good enough for all of your sins. So James isn't saying confess your sin as a recipe to get forgiveness. He's saying confess your sin as a recipe to be healed. Bring it out into the light. And I don't know who that's for today. I don't know who's struggling in a way that they, they can't freely declare the works of God, they can't freely live out their faith. But James is saying to you, the same way he said to them today, find somebody to confess your sin to, somebody that you trust, somebody that's full of the gospel, somebody who's gonna preach the gospel to me and love me well through it. There's something powerful when we bring our sin to the light. It gets exposed. And then you know what Jesus does with that exposure? He begins to give you a recipe to be healed. He begins to encourage you to get into the word. And he does it through a person who begins to advise you, to keep you accountable, to encourage you perhaps to go to counseling, to encourage you to perhaps to stop ignoring the thing that you've been struggling with for a very long time and start getting serious with it. And here's what that requires. That requires us to submit to somebody. Another favorite word for America. Submission for believers. Submission and obedience. It's a tough one. It's a biblical one. Hebrews 13 and 17 says, Obey your leaders, submit to them, for they're keeping watch over your souls as those who will have to give an account. Let them do this with joy and not with groaning. Every single one of us have to be in submission in one way or another so that God can use them in our life to bring accountability and healing into our world. If we as individuals are not in submission to anybody, we are a dangerous believer. And James says, make sure to submit to one another. Submitting to somebody, maybe submitting to a parent. It could be submitting to a mentor that God has put into your life or a coach that God has put into your life or somebody who's helping you with a struggle. And here's what James says, when they, when they call you to action and they challenge you to not just sit around and think about it, but begin to live out what you want God to do, he says this, he says, make sure to let them do it with joy and not groaning. What that means is that, have you ever given advice to somebody before and they took it? They were like a sponge. That's fun, isn't it? Isn't it joy to your soul when you're mentoring and praying and somebody takes it and it's just amazing? But he, but he says, hey, don't be a pain in the butt. Yeah, I said it, but don't be a pain in the butt. Don't be the kind of person that comes for advice and does nothing with it. You are not a joy. I can do nothing more for you after I've counseled you led you to the word of God, and you take no actionable faith, James says. You're somebody who's listened to the word, and you're not doing anything about it. James says, God loves you too much to live a life like that. Did you know that? Did you know that it is the kindness of the Lord to call you out on the carpet in this way? Because here's what he says. He says earlier in James, he said, those who look into the mirror and don't forget what it says and continue in it, they will be blessed. Yeah. He wants to challenge you because he wants you blessed, not broken. In your notes, write this down. Uh, faith is invisible without works. Faith is invisible without works. And here's why, because works are the language of faith. Works are the language of faith. 